<laughs> Dolliver's cousin. How do you remember the story about Dolliver? Okay, Dolliver was uh, uh, a man who, uh, well, Jonathan Swift wrote this story in, back in the, the 1726, and it was actually a political uh, a political satire. And in the story, we find this man, Gulliver, passing through the land of the Lilliputians. And these Lilliputians were a race of very small men. And compared to Gulliver, he was a giant to them. And they find Gulliver stretched out on the ground asleep. And they approach him with great caution, wondering whether he's dead, but they find out that he, he's only sleeping. And while he's asleep, He's harmless, and since they're afraid of this giant, they they uh, use this opportunity to bind him with multiple ropes. Maybe you've seen the, the picture of, of this giant and all these ropes wrapped around him and pegged down in any way. And while the story was a satire on the political and religious happenings of the 18th century England, the idea of a sleeping and maybe an impotent giant illustrates well the church as a whole and perhaps many believers too. How many of us and how many believers are asleep to the full potential of what Christ has for us? The full potential of the Christian life. It's possible, or is it possible that we're living on crumbs when we could be feasting at the finest of buffets? This morning in our study of Ephesians, this is potentially a wake-up call to believers in Jesus Christ. It's a prayerful plea to God to open the eyes of our hearts, to see Christ in his glorious fullness and the abundant life which he has promised to us. John 10.10, 10, Jesus is saying, I came that you might have life and might have it more abundantly. So open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1, and we'll begin reading in verse 15. For this reason I, too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus which exists among you, and your love for all the saints, I do not cease giving thanks for you, or making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. Praying that God would open the eyes of our hearts just to see the greatness of what God has for us. I draw this idea of sleep from verse 18 when Paul is, is saying that, that their eyes might be enlightened, that they would see the light. It's kind of if their eyes are closed. They're slumbering. They're alive to be sure, but they're less than effective because they're slumbering. There's no doubt they're alive. He sees good reasons to praise God for them. Two areas stand out to him, their faith and their love. We remember that Paul had spent three years ministering in Ephesus during his second missionary journey. Ephesus was a, both an economic and a political center, a religious center too, from which the gospel quickly spread to all the surrounding areas. And although many of the believers there in Ephesus were personally known for Paul, this letter was written three to five years after that, and, and the church had grown. There were more, a lot of new people there that he knew only by reputation. But he was getting reports, and there were people that would travel out of Ephesus and where Paul was, and this was one of the prison epistles, so they would come and they would tell him what was happening in Ephesus. And the reports he received was they were, they were, this church was strong in faith. Their faith in the Lord Jesus was strong. In addition to their strong faith, they had something more 
They have the reputation of loving one another. I appreciate, Gail, you know, what you said about the about how Jesus said, they will know you by your love. A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another. He compliments them for your love for all the saints. Notice that little word, all. Back in the 70s, Francis Schaeffer wrote a book called The Mark of the Christian. And it was about love. Jesus gave us that commandment. And he said we're to love one another. You know, some people are easy to love. Some of us take a little bit more effort. I was reminded this week that there were believers who supported other candidates than I did. And I'm to love them. These people in Ephesus had love for all. For all the believers. And it's easy to believe doctrine or facts about God. It's quite another matter to demonstrate our faith practically by loving one another. Especially those who are a bit harder to love. And love truly is the mark of the Christian. I have to ask myself, could it be said that I am primarily identified as a Christian by the love I show to others? Paul was convinced of their spiritual vitality by their faith proven by love. And having heard of this, he, he assured them of his unceasing prayers. This passage is a prayer of thanks to God. But it also serves as a prayer of challenge to us. For even though the church was filled with faithful and loving believers... He knew few believers really maximize their potential in Christ. That's why Paul wrote this letter, to help them understand, help us to understand and experience all the blessings that God has in store for us, all the benefits of our relationship with God. They made a great beginning, but perhaps they were in danger of settling for crumbs when they really could be feasting. And that's where the idea of alive but asleep comes into play. We believers, including those in Ephesus over 1900 years ago and today, can easily become like slumbering giants, capable of so much, having so much innate strength in the Lord, but using so little of that power. We can become complacent, we can become self-satisfied, we can sluggishly lie around, perhaps even sleep, accomplishing only a fraction of what God would have us accomplish. And after a while, we convince us, convince ourselves, well, this must be all there is to the Christian life. Have you ever wondered, as I have, that perhaps I'm just scratching the surface? of what God desires for me. It's living on the outskirts of God's blessings and power. A common sight in, much, in most large third world cities like Sao Paulo, Brazil, and Mexico City is the shantytown settlements that surround the main city. Millions of people living in poverty so many believers live in spiritual shanty towns, never venturing into the center of the city where the king resides. And Paul saw this danger of many people settling for less than God's best, living in spiritual poverty. And he's writing these words to whet our appetite for what's possible and what is ours because we're children of God. The Holy Spirit, through Paul, is, is desiring to awaken our spiritual senses. And the prayer of this great apostle is that God would stir us up, creating a hunger within us to know God better. I mentioned last week that one unmistakable sign of the Holy Spirit in our life is a desire for intimacy with God, for getting closer and knowing Him. 
Galatians 4, 6 told us that because we are sons, God has sent his spirit into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. And we need to ask ourselves, do we hear the spirit tugging in our hearts, saying there's much more? Would you move closer? And Paul prays that God would stir them up and give them a spirit of wisdom and revelation and knowledge of Him. This is a crucial step in moving toward God. There must be an inward desire. And it begins that way with the desire. I see that there's more and I desire that. Psalm 42.1 says, As a deer pants for the water brooks, so my soul pants for thee, O God. And the picture is of, a, of an animal, a deer, that is, that is so thirsty and panting for the water and walking through a dry place and, and wanting that water. And that's the picture. It says, my heart, O Lord, pants for thee like a deer for the water brooks. He said God would give them a spirit of wisdom and we have to understand that the Spirit here is not speaking of the Holy Spirit. We don't need to pray that God would give us the Holy Spirit. As verse 13 says that, that all believers have already been sealed in the Holy Spirit. God has given us the Holy Spirit. He indwells us. As Romans 8 9 says, If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he doesn't belong to him. So we have the Spirit. The Spirit spoken of here is an inner capacity for which, by which we perceive, by which we feel, reflect, and desire. It's an inner bent or a disposition in a particular direction. For example, we might say that someone has a spirit of stubbornness or someone has a spirit of cooperation. We mean we sense a particular disposition or attitude that they have. And that's a, that, that Paul is praying that we would have an attitude of seeking God's wisdom. This prayer is for the development of this inner spiritual capacity within ourselves, which seeks to know God's wisdom and what he thinks about things. That we have an inner drive to learn and to live in a wise and a godly manner and to follow what God wants us to do. In accordance with the leading of the Word and the Spirit. H.A. Ironside, Harry Ironside, longtime pastor of Moody Church, describes this desire that the Holy Spirit has for us. With these words, he says, He who indwells you delights in his special work of opening up the things of Christ and revealing them to his saints. How does he do that? by giving insight into the truth already revealed in the Word of God. You see, wisdom is living life from God's perspective, a perspective that's found in God's Word. And as this inner disposition to know and follow Christ in our spirit is expressed, the Holy Spirit delights in that. He delights in revealing this ever-expanding knowledge of Christ. A knowledge of our spiritual heritage. This knowledge being much more than head knowledge, but, but heart knowledge. Life-changing heart knowledge. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. We're enabled to see and enjoy precious things we've never seen before. It's interesting this word knowledge is not just a simple word for knowledge. It has that prefix that means it's super knowledge. It's more than just knowing the facts. It's knowing the facts that change within us. Super knowledge. And such knowledge has made its long journey from the head to the heart. It's heart knowledge. The prayer continues building precept upon precept. Paul prays that we would come to experience a new world of hope and riches and power. Look at verses 18 and 19 again. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, 
and what's the greatness of his power toward us who believe. Luke records the record of two disciples walking down the road to Emmaus. It was right after the crucifixion of Jesus and, and they were downcast and they were depressed by the terrible things that happened in Jerusalem. The Lord joins them, but they don't recognize him. He walks along with them as a stranger and begins asking them questions. And, and they, they say, well, haven't you heard all these things that have happened in Jerusalem? He says, well, no thanks. And then they said, we thought that Jesus was the Messiah, but he was crucified and buried. And we just don't know what to do with that. But then he begins to open up the scriptures to them and explain all the scriptures in the Old Testament of how the Messiah had to die, but that he would be resurrected. Remember what they said afterwards, after they reflected on his words. Were not our hearts burning within us as he was speaking to us, as he was explaining the scriptures to us? This burning of heart represents what happens when the eyes of our hearts are opened. It's been described as the enlightenment, the inflaming of the heart, so that it becomes alive and is deeply stirred and moved. And that's what God desires for each one of us, each one of his children. That God's truth becomes so real that it burns in our hearts and captures our full attention so that we can't help but respond to it. And perhaps you remember a time in your life where, where Jesus completely captured and, and captivated your heart. And we would ask, is that a rare experience for you or is it something that you experience often? Is it something that you long to experience? that it would become more than just an occasional thing, that it would become something that, that motivates, that changes your life, that becomes the motivating force in your life. In the last chapter of Ephesians, we learn that we're involved in a great spiritual battle. It rages around each one of us at all times. There are great and powerful spiritual forces in the unseen world that attempt to bind and darken and blind us to what God has in his truth. And since there are spiritual struggles, we fight them only with spiritual weapons. And notice that prayer is the weapon of choice. As we are armored up to loosen this grip of darkness on our minds, this spiritual blindness. Paul has three distinct petitions. The first of this is the hope that we would know the hope of his calling. So what is the hope of his calling? What has God called us to? He's called us to himself. If we read in the words earlier in this chapter, God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. The hope of his calling is that we are secure in Him. He has called us. And He has sealed us. And we are His children. And one day we're going to see Him face to face. That is our hope. And we're going to become like Him in holiness, free from all the constraints of sinful flesh. Free from the presence of sin completely. That is the hope of His calling. That he's called us to salvation. He's called us and he's redeemed us. And Paul is saying that I pray that the eyes of your heart be in light. That you would see the hope that you have. That transcends everything else. And, it, and all circumstances, whatever they might be that come into our life. That we have the hope of this call. And that we would grasp that. We would live in that hope. That he's going to return. He says, I go and prepare a place for you. He's going to come again to take us where he is. I find the words of John MacArthur to be compelling. 
Until we comprehend who we truly are in Jesus Christ, it is impossible to live an obedient and fulfilling life. Only when we know who we are, who we really are, can we live like who we really are. Only when we come to understand how our lives are anchored in eternity can we have the right perspective and motivation for living in time. Only when we come to understand our heavenly citizenship can we live obedient and productive lives as godly citizens here on earth. Our citizenship is in heaven. The hope of his calling. He also prayed that we've known the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. In verse 6 we read of the glory of his grace and now we see the riches of that glory. And what is the riches of that glory? It is the church. It is us. We now enjoy the riches of grace and by and by we're going to enter in and enjoy the riches of his glory. It speaks not about the inheritance we will receive which will be glorious but that we are God's inheritance. We belong to God. He paid for us for his property and it's his delight to involve us in his great plan. And as we make ourselves available to God to be used by him. And he begins to open up vistas of fulfillment and enjoyment that we would never have imagined. I hope this, you, you found this to be true in your life, that there is joy in serving Jesus. Now realize that the enemy is going to tell you just the opposite of that. Our enemy is going to tell us that serving God is dull, it's drab, it's dreary, that it's duty. Understand if we listen to that voice very long, it becomes kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. Our old selfish nature takes joyful service and turns it into dreary duty. And I think we all need to examine ourselves as we serve the Lord. Are we doing it just when I let just what I need to do? Or do we do it out of joy? But that's not as God has intended this dreary duty. The Christian life is to be an exciting adventure as we step out and take risks for doing something new. So many people sit around waiting for God to, to lead them to do something significant in their lives. Listen, God has already equipped us and given us every spiritual blessing. We have His Holy Spirit and our job is just to step out in obedience and do whatever presents itself. It's kind of like the, the little saying that says, bloom where you're planted. Each one of us has a unique circle of friends. A unique circle of influence. Now our circles of influence overlap each other, but you have a group of friends and you have a relationship with those friends and acquaintances that nobody else in the world has. And God wants you to to be a light to all those people in however way that we that he leads us to do that. God delights to involve us in the most exciting adventure possible, the service of the king. And that's to be our number one priority in life. It's to serve the king, to advance his kingdom, to live in such a way that we are light and people are attracted to the light. A final element we'll discover as the eyes of our hearts are opened. Paul prays that we will begin to understand the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. This subject is, is large. And it's important enough that I want to devote next Sunday's message to the power. The resurrection power that's available to us. But I will say this, as we read on, it is resurrection power. Most evidence when it's found in the cemetery. Giving new life. Resurrection power is found only after a death occurs. 
I'm going to expand on that theme next week. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. I want to see Jesus in all of his fullness. And Jesus alone is the joy and the fulfillment and the purpose and love and everything in life worth seeking. Everything in life worth seeking is found in Jesus. And as we seek him, then he opens up everything else. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. That's the key to life. That's the key to the abundant life. A desire in our hearts that, God, you would reveal yourself to me. I want to know your will. I want to follow you. It begins with that desire, a burning in the heart for God. And it's your the asking. God wants that more for you than you do yourself. It says in 1 John 5 that if we ask anything according to his will, he not only hears us, but he's going to give us that. Is it according to God's will that you would have a burning heart for Christ? Of course. It's ours for the asking. Are we ready to ask it for yourself? If not, we need to ask ourselves, why not? Why wouldn't that be our asking, our request of him? Shall we pray? Lord, you challenged us this morning. And I pray that your spirit would take these words, Father, words from your word, from your Holy Spirit, saying, open the eyes of my heart, Lord, that I might see the greatness of who you are and what you have for me. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.